start recording. Teaching through technology brought to you by University of Alaska Fairbanks and the National Science Foundation. Welcome everybody. This is this is Adam. I'm here today with uh, with Ben and and we are doing a, a live stream about how the air quality meter works and uh, i've got one of these things in the back background right here you can kind of see it up above but by the end of this this day i'm going to have told you a little bit about or you'll, you'll have learned hopefully about what got us started on air quality meters here at uh hilo um, with the upward bound program and the t3 alliance um, and we'll share some stuff and then move into how do you build an air quality meter setting it up and and modifying the LCD display that goes along with it. So it's a kind of fun story, and I'm looking forward to sharing. So if you're watching live, feel free to ask questions. Um, remember, this is this is part of the sequence of what you might do in your own community as you're bringing students through this kind of technology. So again, first, Hawaii in 2018. Now, if you were in Hawaii in 2018, you couldn't not know about the fact that there was a live lava flow that that in March of last year, almost a year ago, there was a crack that opened up and lava started flowing out into the ocean. And when it did that, there were a lot of uh, drastic changes to the way life was here in Hawaii. So I was working as the instructor with a group of students for the T3 Alliance at UH Hilo, and we had been studying the design thinking process as we went through our T3 Alliance curriculum. Remember, the design thinking process is a way in which you work within your community to address a need. So the five stages are really simple here. Empathize, listen, understand what's going on in your community. Then it's define. Then you ideate or brainstorm. We have this little symbol in here for grants because in the event that you're brainstorming a way to solve a problem with technology you need to spend some money in order to try building it prototype and then the last one right there is test so I'm gonna unpack this story with the way that we went through this process and um, and and show how it got us to what we ended up building and how that inspired the air quality kit that Chester and Easybotics built um, that were uh, helping you guys with. So here we go. So the first thing, empathize. Now, this is a short little video clip describing what the Leilani Estates eruption looked like um, in 2018. So you'll hear from a couple of uh, community members that that I found, that I met, that we that we knew about, who were dealing with this situation in a really um, in a very real way. So I had them come in and talk to the camera and talk to our students and just listen to what they have to say and check out some of the photos of what things look like. My name is Susie Lee Osborne. My name is Dina Wentworth. I had a home in Leilani Estates, which I no longer have personally, so I'm in Hilo, but I also am the co-founder and head of school for Cool Kala Charter School. I live at 13-633D, comma, Ely Road, just a mile down from Fisher 8. South. I operate the preschool program for Kuokala. Our main campus is down on the Red Road and has been completely isolated by lava. One of uh, my pressing concerns right now is monitoring air quality. So I think that that's uh, going to be a statewide concern. We have four sites, two sites in Hilo, uh, preschool in Nanavale, which is very critical, and uh, a hybrid online program in Mililii. The prevailing winds, which are the trade winds, are blowing. They're sending the SO2 smoke right from the fissure, kind of down a, a slope right to our, our little subdivision. All right. These guys told their story. You guys could sense that, right? That, that when they were talking, they knew um, about what was happening. Every student, every person who lived in Hawaii at that time was aware of this happening in the backyard. So that's that's big. That was step one, empathize and have the students feel for somebody in the community and then say, all right, I understand that there's a problem. Now let's go on to the next stage and define the problem. How do we put a, a, a pathway to defining that problem? So the next stage is um, 
bump to bump, define. And so we invited the guys from the from the USGS. We invited people from the Department of Health. We invited people into our classroom to come and tell us the story about what is air quality and what happens on the Big Island. So what we had there was kind of a, a historical view. This is a map showing how how the volcano usually erupts and how that that eruption of of gases goes off in a direction that affects people around the island. We learned about particulate matter and how how over time air quality can start to change uh, or or the sulfur dioxide that comes out of a of of a volcano can convert from from um, a, a gas into some particulate matter that can be bad for for your health. So that defining here's a picture of what Kona looked like of a hotel in Kona that was on a bad day during June and here's a picture on a good day during June. We know that there's trade winds that usually tend to blow this stuff off off the off the coast. We learned about all this after our research. The students kept doing research and said, what's being done around the country? Who else knows about this kind of stuff? They came into a example of a project done by some folks called Purple Air. And this project is pretty cool. They've got little small air quality meters that, that fit inside of a PVC pipe and you mount on the outside of your house. I think they're like $250 or something like that. And when you do that, when you mount it on and you hook it up to your internet or connection, then all of a sudden you can get a real-time map of what uh, the air quality is of your location compared to everyone else. So the students saw this, they got excited. Notice this is a map of like Los Angeles where they have, you know, air quality issues that are good, bad based on, you know, traffic. Maybe there's a like a like petroleum refinery or something like that over here. I'm not sure. But the idea was clear. If we could do something like that, maybe we could help people like that. They continue to define the problem and say, what could we do with our Raspberry Pis that could send data out to somewhere and give people some information so that they would know whether they should evacuate or not? So continuing defining the problem, there's a lot of research that goes into defining the problem, but then once you get your research down, it's time to brainstorm. And so lots of sketches got built. Sketches is like, you know, what would our thing look like? Um, and as you guys can imagine, uh, we. We, we brainstormed, we put together a little mini grant, and we got to the next phase where the, the, we started building it. And this is a small little SO2 sensor, this is a small little particulate sensor, and this is a little screen, and of course on a Raspberry Pi. When it actually came down to it, we were going to Home Depot and buying electrical conduit boxes and, and learning to drill stuff and put stuff in with, with, um, with you know silicone and that kind of stuff in order to make it actually function. So that, that was part of the process, building the physical device. And then there was the other part called, how do you program these sensors so that it actually makes sense and it sends data out to the internet? So you're still prototyping phase. You're trying to build it. You had that idea. And then it's time to test it. And the students identified six locations around the island where um, people were dealing with um, air quality issues. And those were, uh, one of them was a, a, uh, a known air quality monitoring site so that we could have a control and the other ones were all places where people were wondering what um, the level of air quality was and if it was safe and healthy and what they were really looking for was some real-time monitoring so here's an example of what the students built real-time monitoring at one of the stations um, where the students were able to know oh this is the level here's the temperature variations at night it, temperature would go down and the temperature would go up so we took bits of data and the students uh, made a video describing that. It looks like I didn't uh, ask permission to watch my own video, so that's that's all right. Um, but anyway, the students uh, put together a video describing what that process was like, and as they went out into their communities, they installed those air quality meters, they worked with people, and taught people how to look at the data so that it made sense. We realized there is a big opportunity here to build an air quality meter that around the country students could use with the T3 Alliance program to monitor air quality in their own place. And what we were doing in our project with the with the volcano was we were making it so that it all went to a little website. That's great. And we're going to teach you how to do something like that where the data goes to a website. But it's also really important for people when they're at locations to be able to look up and say, How's the air quality right now? I feel like it's getting bad. It hurts my throat. I, I feel like we should leave. It's scary. 
And had there been a little LCD display like you see here in this image, that might have helped out a little bit. So this LCD display is part of the air quality monitoring kit that um, that Chester and, and EasyBotics has designed for the T3 Alliance program. And on that kit, there's, of course, a Raspberry Pi with like a little a little thing on it that, that takes the data and brings it... Uh, what would he call this, Ben? A sensor head. A sensor. It sits on top. It sits on top of the Raspberry Pi so that it can take information and bring it up here to this LCD display. And this is like like 128. How big is this LCD display? So it's 64 by 128 pixels. 64 by 128 pixels. So this is big enough so that if you were walking into a school or into a classroom, it could say, you're entering the classroom right now or or you could see something from a distance away. So that's kind of cool. And now let's talk about some of the, the, the meters that we put onto it so that we could be measuring stuff. The first one, if we zoom in right there and say, what are these things? The first one is a particulate meter. And if you don't know what a particulate meter is, hang on, I'll, I'll share with that in just a second. The second one is a, is a highly sensitive CO2 meter. Uh, CO2 meters, um, good for measuring, of course, carbon dioxide. And then lastly, our temperature and humidity and pressure sensor. Um, and first off, how does that particulate matter sensor work? It's kind of cool. It uses a little laser inside of it to bounce light off of the particulate air are the particulate things that are moving around in it. And when we think of particulates, we can think of everything from dust um, to, um, to smoke to uh, pollen anything that's really tiny. And if it's big, um, if, if this laser encounters something that's big, it's going gonna, it's gonna to create one kind of a signal. If it creates tinier things, it'll create another kind of a signal. What you can know is that the data that it comes out with uh, is correlated in a bunch of scientific ways. And we can talk about science projects that can be done to test how good this sensor is. But for now, just know that you can get the amount of certain sizes of particulates in the air. The, SO, or the CO2 sensor is awesome for measuring uh, indoor carbon dioxide levels, or any carbon dioxide levels, really. And carbon dioxide, remember, is a gas. It's a clear and colorless gas. But when um, they use an infrared light source, they can, they can measure the amount of, of infrared light and how it gets uh, scattered through a, a prism. The last one, the BME 280 sensor, is our temperature, pressure, and humidity sensor. And, and this thing is relatively accurate. Um, and I, what I'd just like to bring into our, our, our memory here is when we talk about temperature, um, temperature is a measurement of the kinetic energy of the particles that we're, that we're looking at. So especially for a gas, if I have a low temperature gas, then my particles aren't moving very quickly. And as I heat up that gas, as it gets higher and higher, the kinetic energy of those particles moves around um, higher. If I've contained that, that gas into a, a certain container, then you can imagine as the, as, the, as the temperature goes up, the pressure will go up. So this is a cool little thing that will, do, that will measure all that stuff. Now, what does it mean? This is the exciting part. When we start doing research on what does it mean to have particulates in the air or not particulates in the air, you can imagine that, that, that if there's a, a whole bunch of dust in the air and people are breathing that in, that's probably not good. So the particulate size makes a difference. There's super tiny particulates of, of 10 micrometers uh, to, to uh, um, bigger particles. And when you start measuring this, you'll be able to, to, to say, well, for my community, for whoever I'm dealing with, what does that mean? For carbon dioxide, to just know that there's an outside level that's relatively normal and good. And if you were, on the other, other hand, inside and you were cooking, then your carbon dioxide levels could go high. And as carbon dioxide levels go high, it can start doing things to your body that aren't good. Things like brain damage and... Yeah, all, all sorts of stuff. That's that's the extreme case. But my students had fun looking for what does the data associated with this stuff mean. So now let's get to the real meat of this. How do you build this thing? So I'm going to switch over to a different screen and allow Ben to introduce what the equipment is. Now, first, before we do switch over, this is the website 
the T3 Alliance website. And if you go in there and you just search RPI Air Quality Station, um, you will you will find this link with a ton of photos on it. I'll also put the link at the bottom of this YouTube video so you can see it that way. But at this point right now, we're just going to jump over to our webcam where Ben can walk us through what is this process that we're working on as we're building it. So, Ben, you ready? Yes. All right. So uh, this is how it generally comes when you unpack it. Uh, these screws will be in a bag, but you have this uh, bag of sensors, a Raspberry Pi, the displays themselves, uh, some wood to mount it all on, and then the uh, actual sensor hat. So the first thing for assembling it is uh, lining up these displays because they do have to be in a particular orientation to work. So you can see that we have these lines uh, printed on the, on the back plate here, and it matches up with these lines on the wood themselves. But uh, when you actually place them on, the lines will be different. So what these lines mean is uh, the way these LED panels work is data comes in one side from the Raspberry Pi, enters the LED panel, and then this LED panel actually sends the data for the other uh, matrix through this panel to the other panel. So the data actually flows in a certain direction, which is what we have to uh, keep in mind when we actually physically place these on the board. So you can see these lines here, how they line up. So when it's actually face down, you'll want these lines to match up exactly uh, as on here. So what that looks like for this one is... So just so I'm clear, you're, you're looking for the opposite thing, right? So if, if, you're, if your arrows are pointing this way, then you're going to want ones that point the other way. So when you're actually this way up, then the lines do match up. So it's a bit of like a geometry puzzle here. Oh, so you're okay. flipping it, and then the lines do match up. Perfect. Got so it. So that looks like this for here. But then when you're actually setting this all up, these are actually going to be upside down. So then you can just flip them like so. And then these vertical lines are flipped. But you, you get the idea of right. uh, what I mean here. And that sure helps that all the arrows are, are, are put onto this little piece of wood there so that way kids can't or we just can't mix up and plug something in backwards yeah and then uh, I like to attach these next so you have these ribbon cables which are polarized we'll get into that later you have these lashes on and it matches up and then connect one to the other like that now is there a right and wrong way to connect those Yes, but they do have a latch on, so you probably won't make that mistake. Okay, I see. But so it's really important to keep that in mind later, because a lot of other, the other connectors are not uh, like that. Okay. And you can plug in the other the wrong way. And this cable going off the side here will plug into the uh, Raspberry Pi sensor hat later, but it's a lot less awkward if you just leave that uh, hanging by itself for now. So that's the first step, just connecting these. So the data will come into this cable, address these pixels on this display, and then the remaining data will go from this cable to this display. So it's as if this cable went straight into that display if we only had one. They work in a chained model, so they send the data along the path. So you could have dozens of these. Oh my gosh. The Raspberry Pi, I don't think it's powerful enough to actually run a dozen of these displays, but for like a giant stadium screen or like an advertising thing, then you could have like dozens of these hooked up uh, wow. running with like a, a video playing on them. That's just not what we do here. Okay, so after that, then it's uh, time to pick up the sensors themselves. So the way the sensors work is this hat here has all kinds of internal connections and stuff. It plugs onto the Raspberry Pi, and then the sensors plug into this. This thing sends the data to the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi processes the data, then the Raspberry Pi calculates what goes on the display, which is then sent through these pins into this uh, sensor hat then out this cable into the displays. So this basically acts as like an intermediary that just syncs, uh, sends information from this to that into the sensors. So that's oh. what this hat does. So all the sensors have to plug directly into this hat. So we have the sensors in this bag here. And I think this summer when we were doing the project with the students, we didn't have that, sent, uh, that hat. So all of the individual connections had to be made and there was just a lot of potential for a mix up yeah, it makes it a lot simpler. Yeah. But there, are, there is still room for error. So here's the first sensor, which is the particulate sensor. It's called a PMS5003. Uh, so uh, it has this uh, cable here. And it has this. It's important to keep in mind this thing because it has a certain orientation on the, on the wood, which you have to keep in mind. It has uh, screws, holes in the bottom. Those have to be oriented down. One, because it won't screw in otherwise. But two, 
because we have to keep uh, which direction it's facing in mind so that this cable is facing the right way too. Because this cable is not polarized, which means you could flip it the wrong way and then if you plugged it in, it could break the sensor or the, uh, the Raspberry Pi cell. So this sensor actually makes uh, one rotation before it plugs in, which where the confusing uh, parts come in. This is explained on the site as well with pictures, so you can take your time with this instead of just following the video. But you rotate this this uh, cable one time before it plugs into the to the head here, which looks like the, this. Got it. Okay, yeah. one time. So the bottom of it goes into the top of that one over there. Yeah. So Got check it. out the website for that because you need to be you need to double check that. That's the complicated part. Now, now you know it's looking the right way, you don't have to worry about it anymore. Next, we have the um, the uh, least complicated one, which is the CO2 sensor. Not the CO2 sensor, this is the humidity and uh, barometer. So, this one uh, does not have to be twisted. Sorry, uh, it's, gonna, it's not going to come in this bag because we are going to test it before we send it to you. Let's see what you can see on that. Sorry. That's right. Got it. Okay. So this one goes face up uh, on the board, and then this cable has these latches on it, which uh, plug in face up like that. And then it does not make any rotation when it goes into the thing. So this cable is totally flat. It doesn't twist or rotate. It just goes straight into the sensor head. And then is the most complicated one, which is the CO2 sensor, which has this crazy ribbon cable where the cables aren't actually attached to each other, which means it's really hard to actually tell if it's flipped or not. This one does have to make a rotation, but there's actually a trick to figure out what's going on. So you can see that on this one, the yellow wire is facing upwards. So if it has to make one flip, then by the time it gets to the, to the hat, the yellow wire will be facing south instead of north. So that's how you can tell which way that one is going to. And that one plugs right there. And the uh, sensor, the place where the sensor is plugging is labeled on the sensor head too. And Ben, I saw that you just kind of push those things onto there. Is that because uh, there's some double? Okay, so it, we we uh, we do provide this uh, these sticky strips. This one has been assembled and disassembled before. Usually, sticking it down is a separate step, but because the sticky strips already on there, I just like stuck it on there. Okay, got it. But that would be a separate step usually. And this one screws in, which we haven't done yet. So. Uh, Next, we do actually just screw everything together, which is one of the long steps. So I have this fancy electric screwdriver that does not come with the kit, so you have to use a regular screwdriver. Oh yeah, but before we can actually attach these panels, it's these power cables. So those ones do have a polarity, and it's there's labeled on the panels ground and VCC, uh, which is like voltage current or something. So ground has to line up with black on the cables. So uh, that's like that. And there is also a latch on these cables which should make it obvious, but you, you have to look at the text too. Awesome. So now we start screwing everything together, which is where this giant pile of different screws and uh, spacers comes in. And we do not attach uh, this yet because it makes it more awkward when we flip these panels over. But first you take these uh, these long spacers and these, those will screw into these uh, points on the, uh, on the matrices which line up with the holes on the, on the wood here. Oh, and it probably keeps it so that you're not pushing the panel against the, 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 the wood or the wires. The wires aren't getting yeah, sandwiched in there. Yeah, it makes space for everything in there. Hmm. Does, do, does the L, LED, is it LED screen? It's up? LED, not LCD. Yeah. So does it heat up like significantly during when it's operating? Um, really? I don't think the panels really heat up. The Raspberry Pi can get warm. Okay. But not hot, not like burning you hot. Awesome. And I like how you're doing it so that you can just flip the whole thing over at once and be. And be golden. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and be all. Cool. Well, this, this, this would have answered the question that some of our community members this summer were having, as I was mentioning there, that in. In certain places where we went and installed an air quality meter, we ended up having to put a TV, like a plug in a TV monitor and just log the TV with an extra Raspberry Pi into 
the website so that if somebody locally didn't have a phone and wanted to know what the air quality was like, they could just look on the TV. So there's a lot of ways to do this, but what's nice about this is that, uh, look at that, just flipped right over. Yep, and then these will line up with the holes. And then it's kind of orchid, but you have to like squeeze all in. But none of this stuff, everything's already plugged in the right way, so it doesn't matter if all the sensors flap around and stuff. So you just gently flip the whole thing over, or you won't flip it over, you'll just... I just hold it. Just hold it. It's hard to tell from the camera angle. So can you look at the big screen there? Or we'll go one, like there, and then we can see... Yeah, I just hold it vertically and then line up the screw on the back and uh, screw it in. Right. Which is awkward, but definitely possible and easy. Yeah. So, Ben, how many students, like, like, is this one student doing this, or it's probably better in a team of a few students, right? Yeah, you can do this in a team. Well, it's definitely one person can do it, but you can have one person do the later steps, like uh, screw the Radley Pine and Sensor hat together while someone else is setting up these matrix panels and stuff. Right, definitely right. Definitely room for cooperation. Yeah. While he's looking at that, I'm going to just jump back and show you guys a little bit of uh, what what things actually look like on the website. If I wanted to find this, I would go to uh, Curriculum Raspberry Pi and um, Air Quality. If I didn't find it right here, I could just come up here and type in Air Quality. If I just type in air quality, setting up the default flow setup and access. That's that's not in depth. In depth, logging in in depth. Okay, I'll put in depth. Wait, it's right there. I didn't set a image. Oh, okay, that's it at the top. All right, so here here's the steps that Ben put together for us so that you couldn't miss this. If you put this up in front of your screen. Uh, on the big screen in, in your classroom, you could go through this, and it's all pretty safely mounted right there. Exactly one twist in the cable. Yeah, that, that really helps out. There's your equipment that you're doing, um, putting the panels together. There's those, those steps. And then it looks like screwing on the, the final stage. I find that... Uh, having one person being quality control and kind of switch, switching off from time to time so that no screws are lost um, and that kind of stuff because of course a lost screw or a, a, a flipped wire here can be can be a expensive expensive thing one thing that I I really love about this kind of a project is that if I'm a science teacher or if I'm a classroom teacher of any sort and I know that I've got a particulate sensor right there or a temperature humidity sensor, um, then all I have to do in order to get a quick test on this thing is blow across it or, or you know, take a little chalk dust and put it into the air right next to it and we can start to evaluate and take a look at what, what things come out like that. The CO2 sensor is so accurate that you can tell like when someone arrived in a room just by looking at the old data and stuff like that, how many people are in a room. Wow. <laughs> like just standing around it for a few minutes can raise the CO2 level by a lot. It's really surprising. And what, what we'll be getting into in a little bit, what's super powerful about this, is that if, if that is a level that we can monitor and say, look at, at this level, blank happens, you could imagine where we can program this sign to say, too many people in the room, somebody should evacuate. You could program it to say, uh, send a tweet to or send an email to blank or all that kind of stuff. Um, I know Chester figured out that the that the pressure sensor, if somebody opened the door to this little shop here, we could see it on a pressure sensor. So in a way, it's like a little uh, motion sensor trigger. Um, it looks like you're all ready, so we'll switch back to that screen here. Okay, so next we'll screw in this uh, sensor, which is the particle. So we have to use these tiny little really thin screws here. But those are screwed straight through the wood into these holes, so we'll do that. Use another and flip the whole thing over some kind of step. Well, now that you've got the big thing on there, it's not so dangerous to flip it over. Yeah. Yeah. So, just curious, how much do those little electric screwdrivers cost? Uh, I don't actually know. I think they're surprisingly expensive. Huh. 
This is a really nice one. There's some really uh, weird ones. There's one which I used uh, up in Hackwell, which actually you have to twist your wrist to make it turn on. Really? It has like an accelerometer in. It's activated by flipping your wrist around. This one is so much uh, more practical than that. Ah. But yeah, these are really nice. Yeah. I could imagine if it was like a full-on screw gun, then you might accidentally overdo it. She just said it's $35. Oh, well, thanks, Chester. Chester's watching and he said $35 for that thing. So maybe it's useful. Otherwise, your students can figure it out in their own fashion. All right, so back to back to the screen. You got that screwed on now. Okay, next, we'll plug in this, which is the uh, data from the hat to the matrices. So that plugs into, you can't really see it on the bottom here, but it's the only one it fits in. So it looks like that. So now it looks almost done. The only thing that's missing from this whole thing is the Raspberry Pi, which I have screwed these spacers in ahead of time, uh, just because that's time consuming but not complicated. But there's a guide on the website for exactly the order of, of how these go in. And by screwing those spacers in, it keeps the, the bottom from touching the wood, right? Yes, so which... on the, uh, the box kits, we put a plastic 3D printed base plate on, but on this one, we just use these spacers to stop all these uh, contacts from getting crushed into the wood when we screw it in later. Yeah. And, and it has the SD card uh, in it already. Already loaded in. Yeah, that should, have, cool. that should be how it comes. Awesome. So we put this on the wood and then flip the whole thing over again and screw those in. Cool. So I noticed there's something on that little, uh, little, little card there. It's a tiny little screen on there. What is that screen for? So that is a tiny OLED display, which actually, the default flow, it displays the IP address of the Raspberry Pi. It's that thing right there. The That's little... for uh, logging into Node-RED later when it connects to the Wi-Fi. Yeah. But... So this, th this whole project is based on the idea that you're not hooked up to this thing as, a, as an actual physical HDMI output. But you can if you want to. You could if you want to. Okay. Awesome. All right. So you got that one oh, right on. Oh, the entire thing in backwards. Oh, you did? I uh, flipped it uh, horizontally, so... Oh, luckily, no. you cannot actually attach everything that's like that. You just, you just need to know you did it wrong so you can fix it. Yep. But yeah, not, not a breaking problem. Yep, and it's always good to have growth mindset in this capacity. You know, if something doesn't fit right, don't shove it, don't force it, and don't feel bad about it. Here's a screen uh, that you took just showing just how nicely it fits together. It looks like it's a real nice a nice flow and then it should just fit on there. Place our pie here. Oh. Okay. So, we we'll go back and see how your progress is coming. So, a little later on, this is just a preview, but but one, one aspect of this thing is that it's going to function locally. So if we just plug this thing into a wall, it should uh, start displaying data from these different sensors, right? Is, is that right, Ben? Yes. Yeah. That's the default. That's the default so that we've set the image that's on that little SD card so that it just knows that when it's plugged in, start displaying you know, this, the humidity, the pressure, and the temperature. But... Since it's not hooked up to a screen, although you could, since it's not hooked up to a screen, we're going to remote into it, and uh, then we can start talking to it and seeing what the flow looks like, and um, we can add a component into it that kind of resembles what we did with the, the different sites here in Hawaii. Um, people want to be able to, to go to a website and find out what's the pressure in this room right now, and if... Chester was wondering how many times his door had been open, or if if he hadn't uh, closed the door at night for some reason, and, and maybe Hawaii was a cold place, he would notice that his door was open. If if he was looking at that, okay. So Ben, how's it going? Almost. I've uh, yeah, I just put the hat on top. It very snugly settles on top. Cool. Just checking the the. Uh the gap here between the pins and the, the pad. So can you move it up a little bit so we can see okay, what you're so checking? So you're just you're just checking to see that... I'm checking to make sure that these pins are seated properly. Okay. Uh, just like on the website, you can see better. Got it, I see. 
you're looking for a good connection. You know, and if you say back on the website, that means somewhere over here, he's checking to make sure the pins have seated properly. Yeah, just like that picture. Just like that picture. Because if they didn't seat properly, or I've had it happen before where a student bends one of these pins because they're they're shoving it wrong the wrong way, and then all sorts of things don't work. So, so just, you know, there's quality control. Things in technology either work or they don't. All right, are we almost ready to plug it in and see if it powers on? Uh, I'm going to check this one more time. I think I have to flip the, the data cable from this to the LED matrix because it's like blocking the pins from plugging it properly. Okay, so he notices what, what's happening there. Let me try that again. So can you uh, try this camera? Oh, yeah, yeah. Let me put it on the camera. So okay, this uh, ribbon cable was folded underneath it, which was blocking it from plugging it properly. Oh. So I'm to fix right now. So in terms of like just general troubleshooting things about this kind of a thing, just check your cable connections, check the... Okay, that's perfect. So perfect. what I did was just move the, this ribbon cable more that way, uh -huh. which uh, fixed that seating problem. So that's perfect now. Okay. So now what we have to do is just screw this top in, which I will do. Oh, I see. Screw that one in. And I also see that they've drilled holes on this board so that you could mount it somewhere in a, on a wall somewhere. Yeah, we just use zip ties to mount one, to mount the ones in here. But I'll show you if you get more creative right. than that. Right. If this was my classroom, I'd try to put it somewhere like right out in front where kids could see it and notice it and it could be like a... Uh, you know, something we comment on. Okay, now it is ready to plug in. All right. So for first, we're going to double check all these connections here. So this one does not rotate whatsoever. It's perfectly flat on the board, which we can see is true. This one has to rotate one time, which means the yellow will be on top here and on the bottom here, which is true. And this one flips one time as well, which we can check by running our finger along it, kind of like a Mobius strip, I guess. And look, yeah, there it is. Tips one. So everything's correct. We can plug in the power, and this is what it looks like when it first turns on. Perfect. So here comes the power cable. Oh, this is exciting. Right in the bottom here. Now it takes about uh, 15 or 30 seconds to bring the boot out. If this red and green LED on the bottom here show up, then we know everything's probably working. Is it? Is it? Is it showing up? Can you see it? Yes. You just kind of see it from the camera angle, but oh, I see. It is there. Okay. So can you talk us through what is the actual like Pi thinking right now? It's, it's waking up and saying, oh, node red, turn on. Yeah, it's booting, uh, running a Linux distribution, and it's going to start up node red and then connect to the internet. Oh, here we go. Here's the first stuff, temperature, humidity. Oh, wow. And the other centers are pulling uh, is the CO2. So it's... as they come in, you get to see the data, and there it is. Oh, this is so cool. So this is in real time. So if, if, if we were to, you know, push our hand against this and create a, a lower pressure. Maybe we're going to change the air temperature there a little bit. Well, the most uh, this CO2 does take a few seconds to calibrate. So 410 is like its baseline. It'll probably shoot up to like 800 or something in a second. OK. You know this is what I'd be doing in my classroom. Or putting a bunch of plants right next to this thing. Oh, sadly, if we don't have the. Oh, plant. look! There it goes. Yeah, there you go. There it goes. Just took a minute there, and obviously, I have a lot of carbon dioxide coming out of my lungs there. But that's pretty cool. I also changed the temperature and the humidity. So, awesome! And then, what is this thing down at the bottom? E dot queasy. So this G. Dot AQ easy sense for graph dot AQ easy, which is air quality easy, uh -huh. which is actually a website you can go on right now, <gasps> which shows a live graph of your data from the from the uh, Raspberry Pi. Are and you, you can customize this URL here to be your location, so you can make it like Easy Robotics or whatever school you went to, you attended. And and that is is that a uh, is that a a default thing? Yeah. So every one generates its own URL, which is uh, unique to that Pi. It's a G dot AQ easy. G dot A Q E Z. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go up that G dot A Q E A S Y. Got a four in this one. Oh, thank you. And I'm not putting my uh, screen up oh, here. Let me just get sorry. it first. 
G.AQEZ. What's the next one? Uh, dot com. Dot com. Slash. Slash. Uh, zero one. Zero one. Zero five. Zero five. C. C. Nine O F C. Nine O F C. Oh, it's nine zero F C. So. Nine zero F C. Oh, this is exciting. Now. Oh my gosh. Loading Grafana. So Whoa. because we just turned it on, then there's not many data points on here. But you can wow. see just the start of the CO2 graph shooting up and uh, the temperature and humidity just the beginning Just of the starting day. down here. So that's the last six hour plot. So that's oh, why wow. you, you can't kind of see like there's any data on it yet. Okay. Well, there's, there's something in here though. This must know already that it's on the internet, right? Yeah, so by default, it connects to an RPI network, which we have instructions on how to set up. And also, okay. I think you can get a thing that's pre set up for that. Cool. But there's also instructions on how to connect it to your own Wi Fi. But all this local data stuff will always work. The only thing that needs Wi Fi to work is this like online data logging stuff. Okay. All right. So here's where the connection is between you've just plugged this thing in. If you did get onto the same network and your computer is on the same network, meaning right here my computer my computer up here if I check oh up here it looks like I'm on this this Wi-Fi network right here but if I was on a different one called RPI then that would work here but now that we're on that network we can go back to this little tiny screen right here and we've got what we need to remote into this Pi is that right yeah we can connect to the node red that's actually running this this uh, this oh. screen right here all right well to me that sounds like the next the next uh, thing on our on our to-do list it's first was let's build this thing and we build it we powered it up um, if you are following along with us and looking for what is the uh, the URL remember there's another there's another there's a whole set of of instructions and tutorials if I click curriculum and I click uh, um, Raspberry Pi I think it's the one called RPI logging Data to Grafana, is that it? Or is it the. Yeah, so that's how you set up the putting the data on Grafana and then they're setting up the first time flow, which is what we're probably going to do, is a separate one. Okay, I'll type in F L O W. I'll just search it up there and I think I'll find it. Air quality, yeah, so setting yeah. up the default yeah, flow. So this is this is what we're about to do. So if you're following along with us here, otherwise I will have this up on the, the, the YouTube video in a little bit. But let's go ahead and I'm going to give Ben over to my computer here and we are going to. Uh, use the little the little o the OLED IP address to go ahead and type in what our what our password is here. So that being said, which is my screen that works best? That one right there. All right, Ben, let's go ahead and type in what we got up there. Okay, so it is this a war IP address? So it's like ten dot seven one. Oh no! Look what happens when he types ten dot seven one. Yeah. Oh, he'll, he'll get it. The, it's the he'll he'll lines. still get it. Yeah. One five one, one three five, and then the port number eighty eighty eighteen eighty. So that should work. Yes, it does. Okay, yeah. and then put it back onto the screen, and we should be good. So this is what the default. Uh, <laughs> okay. The default flow looks like. Uh, so all the stuff that's currently on the actual LED is all programmed from this uh, node red, which you can change and modify any time or completely just delete everything here and make your own flow, which is just the default. So down here we have the section to publish the data to Grafana. It pulls the sensors, it sends the sensors into this Grafana node, and then it prints the URL on display, which is what's at the bottom of the screen. And then all up here we have the part which uh, prints the data onto the actual display itself, which is a separate step. Then we have this other flow up here, which is actually the Nyan Cat uh, flow, which is turned off by default. So you can you don't even have to do stuff that's that's air quality related. You can just uh, do fun like side projects and like uh, animated wallpapers and stuff. That's this small flow here is all it takes to uh, have a animated cat running across your screen with all kinds of crazy bubbles and stuff. So first on this one right here. This is default on the thing. You're logged into it so that you can you can see what it is. If you wanted to, um, if if let's see, so because you've already set up the the sending it to the cloud on Grafana, as long as we know what that address is, 
then we know that it's there. If we wanted to send it to a different thing like things speak or something else, we would probably modify one of those output. Yeah, so we could we could drag in a thing speak node, which should be installed by default. We can check here. Or am I okay? Okay, thing speak. So this is what a thing speak node looks like. Uh, and then you have all kinds of settings here. We have we have I think we have a tutorial on thing speak on the website. Yeah. Okay. But it's actually a lot more complicated to use than the uh, the one we have set up. So the Grafana node here, one thing you can do with it is you can actually change the URL which you use, which is called the uh, location name. So right now it's like crazy serial number type looking thing, uh -huh. but you could change that to be like Easybotics or something because like that's the name of our location. And also you can uh, customize your location on the planet using a geohash, which is like a code which uh, says where you are on the Earth. And then wow. using that, we can look at a world map on Grafana, which shows the air quality depending on where you are on the globe. So we could make like a T3 alliance, like like yeah. geohash where we are kind of thing. Yeah, so there's actually a website here. Oh, cool. Uh, how do you right click on Oh, you have control click. Okay. Yeah, control click. Yeah, so you can open that menu tab. So the way this works is you just scroll around this map, find where you are on the Earth. So we are somewhere in Hawaii. Say OK right there. How do you uh, zoom on a map? You have two finger scroll or two finger spread. Oh, okay, that works. So. With this, you don't want to be too precisely the location because anyone can see like what location you put, and unless you really need to know the air quality between like one part of the street to the other part of the street, like you really don't need that to be that precise. Got it. But the way you can get infinitely precise with this geohash, so you could even like zoom in all the way to like what part of the building you're in. Wow. But, like eight e nine nine is like kind of very own as you know, this one below it. Here. So, so like I see. So 8E98 would be like the, the general location of where we are. But if you really wanted to, you could zoom in like really close and get like a super long geohash which would say exactly wow. where you are on the Earth. Okay, cool. So, so back here in Node Red, we can put uh, 8E9 for East Hawaii and then done. And then every time you make a change with the flow, you want to come up here and hit deploy, which actually deploys your changes. So did we change that custom URL? Right. So it looks like the, the screen turned off. Yes. Well, and think... then it turns back on. And then let's see, there's the CO2 sensor. Yes, yeah, so here's a new URL. Oh, cool. So now if we go to g.qez.com slash easybotics, we'll get one for here. Yeah, but the only problem is because the data is in a six hour thing, right. you it's... don't get much of a pretty output if okay. you do that. Well, is it possible? I'm, I'm, I'm sure it is possible at some point to go in and mess around with like the real time right now, six hours, one hour. Yeah, you can change the time scale on that. Okay. Let's just let the data accumulate for a while first, though. Right. Be able to centrist calibrate it. But going back to my my screen here, if I if I actually wanted to like add an if then scenario or something like that in yeah, here. Yes, so we have an example set up here that sends an email. Oh, cool. So this is the CO2 sensor node. Mm -hmm. It comes here into a switch node, which says if the, the payload is greater than 1,200, then uh, send it through. And then we set, set up an email here with this just random, uh, hold on. It's kind of breaking. Oh, it fixed it. OK. Then it says CO2 levels in office has risen above the rec CDC recommended level of 1,200. Wow. And then it can come into this email node, which actually sends an email out, which you can use a Gmail account for, which we haven't set up by default because you need a Gmail account. Wow. So that's just an example of one of the air quality related things you can do. So tell me, if I if I was a teacher and I had a bunch of students working on this with me, I didn't want them to mess up this 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 flow that you've put in here as the default. Could I just copy this whole flow and, and have like a, a playground sandbox one? Yeah, so you can duplicate the flow here, but if you really want to back it up, then you can come here and click export and export the entire thing as like a text and copy and paste it into a file somewhere. Uh -huh. So you could definitely back it up even like a flash drive or something. But if you want to just copy it, then I'm pretty sure you can do that too. Yeah, just drag the whole thing and copy everything. 
Yeah, you're not used to a Mac. Yeah, there you sorry. Go. That's all right. Okay. Uh, well, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure there's a way to duplicate it as yeah. I can't figure it out on this one. All right. Well, that's that's good information to know. Cool. Hey, can you can you as long as we're here and playing around with this, can you show us a little bit? Turn off this flow so that so that we can play with the cat thing that you that you put together. Because I could imagine a lot of people just in their classroom wanting to have a sign that says. Hey, welcome to my classroom, or welcome to uh, Upward Bound somewhere. Yes. Yeah, so to do that, what we have to do is come up here and disable this flow, uh -huh. and then come over to this other default flow, and then click Enable. It even has a nice description here. And then if you deploy this one, then we should get the cat. Then if you switch to the uh, the, the seven, here's the cat. Here's the wow. cat flying across this way. All right. So it's an animated cat. Look at that. The tail's going up and down, and then there's there's bubbles bouncing around and if I'm a student and I'm I'm controlling this thing I'm super excited right now to like start playing with this so how do I can I can I set it up so I can see the cat and the thing at the same time um, okay there we go so can I see the computer screen and the oh. and the cat don't know if I, I can do that yet that. oh well that's right oh there we go computer screen and the cat so let's try to make the cat go faster or slower, or let's try to make a bubble do something different. Okay, so these this entire flow is set up using function nodes, so it's actually pretty complicated. But there's always going to be at least one student in the class which gets this kind of stuff right off the bat, mm. I think. <laughs> awesome. So here you can see where it uh, increments the location of the cat. So we must increase that to 10 instead of 1. Then the cat should automatically go 10 times faster. Okay, can you put it back onto the screen so we can um, see the cat? Just, did we just change it to... Yes, now the cat is like skipping across this. The display. Look at the cat. The cat's gone faster. So one of the ways which this flow is uh, changed is actually the the main settings here. There's a refresh delay on the matrix, which is default 500 milliseconds. So if we raise that to every 100 milliseconds, then it will be animated a lot smoother. So we can see all the results of that. Oh, look at that! Oh, wow. And yeah. then we can uh, actually lower this. Another way we can change it is put this back down to one, and this would make the uh, cat itself get updated faster with this inject node. So right now it's injecting four times a second, but we could raise that to ten times a second. Got it. Oh, look at that! Now Which it looks makes like the, the animation cat's... smoother. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. All right. So if I'm a if I'm a teacher and I've got a bunch of students in my class and we're doing a community helping project. We just know that having graphics on there, we could have the power of sending the data that we've just collected about the air to somebody through email, through all that kind of stuff. But we could also just have it display in big, bold letters, guess what? The air quality has just changed, and then have a cat that acts like it's a big deal, and it would be a challenge to come up with what could There's you come up with. There's an example flow that does stuff like that on the on the T3 Alliance website, like one that displays like a, a, a picture of like a fl an animated flame if it gets too hot and like a rain cloud if the humidity is too high, things like that. Awesome. Awesome. And, uh, the, the possibilities with it are really unlimited. Like for example, we had a flow once where one air quality uh, meter was sending text messages through another air quality meter through the internet, which would then display on the uh, the on the screen. Oh, that's right. Like yeah. A, a chat from one classroom to another, or you could display like important notifications on the display. Right. Anything you can think of is probably possible through Node Red. We had Pong running, at the game <laughs> Pong, uh, a version of it wasn't finished yet, but you could see the the start of it running using function nodes in Node Red. You wow. Could have wow. The game Pong with a ball bouncing around the screen and player control paddles. Just do what you can do with Node Red. So well, you can do we're going to have to do another show on how to make Pong with a, <laughs> with a thing like that. I think there would be some kids out there who would be pretty excited about that. Um, are there any questions that we see out there on? Uh, uh, no, doesn't look like it. So the last thing I just want to check in with is I see that on the screen here you put these three little random circle bubbles, and are these like basic math? Uh, you know, control things so that if I want the bubble or the circle to go so up or down, we can look at the different. So we have a, a variety of different display, like uh, like basic display objects. The mm -hmm. polygon, there's a circle, and then text, images, and uh, uh, this pixel transform thing. Oh, yeah, but okay. the way that these circles work is that we send it an object that has 
the radius and the location encoded in it. Uh -huh. So you don't have to do this complicated version. Inside the actual circle node itself, you can set the position and radius. Uh -huh. But it's also you can send it a uh, Java a JSON circle thing, which uh, that's the more complicated option. We have more control, and right. you can do this animated like it's kind of stuff. It's still something you could play around with, and yeah. And then for drawing polygons, then you have you can actually draw the shape, which are in turn uh, actually made this. So you can set any number of points on the polygon, let's say three for a triangle. You can set a color. So here we pick a green. Oh, let me just close that. And then we can uh, draw it and we can set it to filled or not. So I'm going to say yes. So, and then we'll give it an input. And deploy your flow. Yeah, and then we go as a green triangle. Wow, so look at that. That's how easy it is to set up uh, Man. basic drawings and, and objects on the display. Now, now if, if, if I'm in a classroom and I've got this mounted on my wall and all the kids are excited about it, I as the teacher could be running this on my computer and showing everybody. But once the students realize that all they need to do is copy that, that IP address, what happens when you get multiple uh, users trying to edit the same IP address on the same network? So Node Red has a feature where it'll tell you the changes to be made and it'll show you the changes. So oh, it, I see. it does do it smoothly. So you can kind of protect against it a little bit. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Ben. That was uh, super informative. And I think that hopefully for all of you guys out there wondering about how could this be a design thinking project or how could this be a possible community project, um, really our intention here is to take that, that common issue that all of us have Air quality is huge. Air quality is anybody who's inside of any kind of a classroom environment, a work environment, either inside or outside, can be paying attention to that. I know last year there were fires throughout California. Here in Hawaii, we had that crisis of, of um, you know, a volcanic eruption. But if there's something going on, then we can use that, that opportunity to address it using some technology and gathering some information that we can then go back and share. Um, our project ended up finishing up when the volcano stopped, but had the volcano kept going, that would have been a really powerful bit of information for everybody. But um, as always, if you have questions, shoot them our way. And um, thank you so much for watching today. Uh, have, a, have a great rest of your day.